Great, Monty, come on forward. Monty's going to light our Christ candle for us this morning. As we gather in the light of Christ, let us sing together, God, prepare me to be a sanctuary. again good morning and welcome to St. Martin's my name is Jordan I'm here with my ministry colleague Keith and together with our musicians with our readers and greeters our ushers and blue ribbon people the technical team we all together seek to engage you in spirit-filled worship if you are new or visiting us this morning we hope that you feel warmly welcomed and if you have any questions please seek out somebody wearing one of these blue ribbons Those are our newcomer relations folks. Now today, following the service, we hope that everybody's going to stay for coffee and cake. You may have, if you were paying attention, notice that there's cake and you might have already had some, which is awesome. That's why it was there. But there's more cake, so that was just your appetizer. So the cake is, is part of our volunteer appreciation. It's thank you cake. So please plan to stay for a slice of thank you cake and coffee and fellowship following the service, whether you're here for the first time or whether you come all the time. Friends, children are always welcome here, and we appreciate the particular ministry that they offer among us. We have a children's church for kids who are three and older. So after the the children's blessing that will happen in a little bit, uh, those children are welcome to head downstairs for children's church and also we have a senior and a junior youth group. Um, If there are any young ones here under three, absolutely welcome to be in the service and we celebrate the joyful noise that often accompanies little ones. If at any point you've got a little one who needs a break, we've got a family room with a change table, a rocking chair, some toys. Please feel free to use it. Go and come as you need to. St. Martin's is an affirming congregation of the United Church and so Ethan, I believe, is going to come on forward and light our rainbow candle, which is a symbol and a reminder to us of our commitment to seek to be an inclusive community. As part of our commitment to inclusion, we seek to be in right relationship with all our neighbors. And so we begin each service by acknowledging the territory on which we live and worship. So in the spirit of reconciliation, let us acknowledge our relationship with the indigenous peoples of this land. We acknowledge that we are gathering for worship on the traditional lands of the First Nations and the homeland of the Métis. We are all treaty people bound by the understandings made in the agreement known as Treaty 6. Carmine, 
is going to come on forward and light our peace candle for us. Peace candle is a symbol and a reminder to us that we are part of a global community of faith that seeks to embody God's peace in the world. So we light this peace candle. So I would like to invite all of the children, all of the youth, and all of the children's and youth leaders to come on forward. I love that about half the congregation stands up at this point and comes forward. That is awesome. So the young folks and the leaders are going to head downstairs for youth group and for children's church. And for children's church, they take a light from the Christ light and they light their own Christ light so that it is amongst them for their worship. And Elizabeth is right here and is going to light that Christ light. But before they head down, friends, let us offer a blessing on these young people and their leaders. So I invite you to extend your arms and hands in a gesture of blessing. Dear God, thank you for these young people and the opportunity they have to explore together our stories of faith. May your spirit guide them and fill them with hope as they learn and practice what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And thank you for the leaders who give their time, energy, and love to support and nurture our children and youth. Fill them with wisdom, grace, and compassion. Bless them in this ministry. We pray for all involved with children's and youth ministry. May they experience your presence in their time together this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Who would like to carry the children's Christ light down? Yep. All right. It's a two-handed job. You got to hold. Got her? All right. If you need help on the stairs, one of the adults can help you, okay? All right. Follow the leaders in the light downstairs. Friends, please join me in our invitation to worship. You're invited to speak aloud the parts that are in yellow. We gather today proclaiming God's love and seeking God's blessing. In gratitude, we come proclaiming our thanksgiving and seeking to live out our love. Let us pray together. Generous God, giver of every good and perfect gift, we lift our voices today to express our thanks and praise for health and strength, for family and friends, for our homes and this church community, and for your abiding and life-giving presence. We say thank you. For your love which knows no bounds, and for empowering us to share your love with others. We sing your praise. Make us deeply aware of your presence today as we gather together to worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Susan, and this is why I give. I have spent most of my life as a member of a church. When I was young, I belonged to the Anglican Church. I belonged to the choir. 
I took classes and was confirmed and participated in youth conferences. As an adult, I joined the United Church and found lots of differences in the service styles and the exact same acceptance and love from each church family that I joined, first in Moose Jaw and now in Saskatoon. I recently shared a reflection that talked about our, what our purpose in life is. I believe that our purpose in life is to glorify God and to enjoy God forever. And that is about putting God at the center of our lives. It is about being clear about what is most sacred in our lives and not letting anything get in the way of that. Sharing our time and skills is glorifying God. Loving and caring for family and friends and contributing through our jobs and volunteer work is all very significant and necessary in our world. Our churches and our communities are sustained by what we each offer. And I believe with all my heart that my church family is just as important in my life as my family at home is. We are called as individuals and as congregations and communities into God's mission. We participate by giving the gifts that God has entrusted to us. These gifts are everything that we have, our time, our talents and skills, and our treasure or physical resources. This is why I give. Being a Christian is not just about what we believe. It's a way of life. And God has blessed us abundantly. Our response to God's generosity is to care for God's beloved world and all of our neighbors, near and far. This includes caring for ourselves as well as others. Friends, let us pray. Generous God, we know that every action and decision we take, no matter how mundane, is our response to the sacred responsibility you have given us to care for your creation and all our relations. You have blessed us and call us your beloved children. Help us to live our lives with loving and generous intention. Forgive us when we focus on our perceived scarcity instead of your abundance. Renew us with your grace and teach us to pattern our lives after Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. This morning's Minute for Mission is very appropriate, as it is Trans Remembrance Day. We are a family. Our gifts for mission and service supports ministries like Our Place Society in Victoria, B.C., which offers programs for those on the margins that make everyone feel like family. One of the proudest moments of the Victoria Pride Parade was when a young pre-op transgender woman said that she never felt brave enough to walk in the parade until the day that she marched with the staff and family of our place. It says a lot about the unique downtown center for Victoria's most vulnerable that this woman felt included in our place's definition of family. It is one thing to preach hope and belonging, but quite another to live it. Loving our neighbors is at the core of our place, as all who come through its doors become family. If mission and service Giving is already a regular part of your life. Thank you. If you have not given, please join me in making mission and service giving a regular part of your life of faith. Loving our neighbors is at the heart of our mission and service. St. Martin's gives 10% of your regular offering to the mission and service, service fund. Additional gifts are always welcome. Loving our neighbors is at the heart of our mission and service. So friends, as we prepare to share our gifts of intentional living, let us pray. 
Almighty God, we come before you with open and willing hearts. Help us to see and be thankful for your abundant blessings. Give us insight, courage, and conviction as we choose to live intentionally as good stewards. Bless our intentions for the environment, our time, talents, treasure, and our mental and physical being. We ask you to empower us with your spirit and infuse us with Christ's redeeming love. Amen. As we give thanks for God's blessing and blessings in our lives and make our offering of, of money, we also know that there are so many more ways that folks contribute to the life and ministry of this congregation, without which like, none of this happens. So I just want to list a few of the ways that people contribute their time, their talents, their love, their energy. And just notice if you see yourself in any of this. There are folks who help out with worship every week. We've got ushers and blue ribbon people. We've got readers, greeters, the tech team each week. We've got folks who take up the offering and those who serve communion. There are musicians, the choir, the band, the handbells. We've got folks who light candles for us and folks who come in and preach. And there's folks who make coffee for us every Sunday and open the door so we can get in. There are folks who offer pastoral care in this congregation. We've got lay pastoral visitors, home communion volunteers. We've got callers and prayer mates with the ministry by phone program. We have a prayer shawl ministry, folks who knit and crochet constantly to make these prayer shawls. And then there are so many people who provide foods or offer rides or just uh, whatever help is needed when folks are sick or just coming out of hospital. The United Church Women uh, offer service in so many ways through their unit membership. There's a card ministry. They make lunches for food and uh, for funerals and for special events. There's folks who may not be unit members, but they come out and they help out. And then there's folks who support the families that we sponsor as refugees. And then there's those who help out at Chop and Chat and the Lighthouse and all kinds of other outreach ministries that we are part of. People donate to the food bank, to the White Buffalo Youth Lounge, to EGADS, and many other organizations like the Advent Tree, who folks will be bringing in PJs for kids who are in need. And then there's all the people who sit on committees, who sit on the board, who are trustees of this church, or are part of some other team that meets to, to carry out the work of this congregation. There's children's and youth leadership, leadership by children and youth, and leadership with children and youth. Folks who volunteer at, or provide snacks for PD Day Camp and for VBS. And then there's all the folks who come and help at special events like the garage sale, the ham supper, the pasta supper, folks who come out and decorate the church each year for Christmas and Advent. And then there's a team of folks who clean all of these chairs for us every year. And folks who plant flowers and beautify the grounds and do all kinds of other work around the building to keep it standing and comfortable. And there's folks who organize midweek activities here like the cards and board, or cards and games, and the book club, and many other activities that take place here throughout the week. So if you saw yourself reflected in any of these categories, or if you've ever contributed to the life of this community in any of these ways or other ways, know that we appreciate your service, the gift of your time and your energy. It matters. We cannot be church without this. Thank you. Thank you. It is noticed and appreciated. And we hope you'll eat some cake. But mostly we hope that you will know that your service 
is essential and we are so grateful. Friends, let us pray. Creating God, we give you thanks for the gift that is life, for the changing seasons, for the tiny seeds that in your holy mystery become life-sustaining food, cleansed air, beauty to behold, and life itself. We thank you for the gift of life. Loving God, we thank you for the gift of family, friends, and community. Those who know us so well that they know when to hold our hand and when to let go. We thank you for those people who journey with us in our times of joy and especially in our times of sorrow. Thank you, God, gift of love. Compassionate God, we thank you for holding us in troubling times. We pray for those who are journeying through illness, awaiting medical diagnosis, those with life-threatening and degenerative diseases, and all those in our community of faith who have asked to be remembered in prayer. So we lift up Heather, Jean, Lorna and Aaron, Jill, the McMurtry family, Margaret, Gladys, Jana, Amy and family, Lucille, Norma, Roy and Janet, Carol and Bob Fay, and Myrtle Dixon, and all those known to us whom we name now in silence. God, we know that we do not journey alone, but that you are always with us. We thank you for the gift of compassion. Challenging God, we thank you for writing your law upon our hearts so that we are called to seek justice and to live kindness. Thank you for moving us to action and challenging us to be your hands and feet in a world so desperately in need of healing. We thank you for the gift of challenge. God of all time and space, we thank you for the gifts of life, love, compassion, and challenge. Help us to know that each small individual action, together with another's action, can make a difference to the world and a world of difference. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you for the gift of your call to discipleship. And now let us sing together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Listening for God's Word, Luke 1, 68 to 79. Bless the Lord of God of Israel, who has looked favorably on the people and redeemed them in the house of God's servant David. As we, God has raised up a mighty Savior for us in the house of God's servant David, as was spoken through the mouth of the holy prophets from of old, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the land of hand of all who hate us. Thus God has shown the mercy promised to our ancestors and has remembered God's holy covenant, the oath sworn to our ancestor Abram to grant us that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve God without fear 
in holiness and righteousness before God all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way, to give knowledge of salvation to God's people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. This is testimony from our ancestors in faith. Thanks be to God. Friends, please pray with me. Holy One, you speak to us in music, in scripture, in silence, and in words shared. We pray that you will speak to our hearts, our minds, our ears, that we may hear what it is you are saying to us this day. Amen. The scripture passage that we heard read this morning from Luke is called the Song of Zechariah. Zechariah is John the Baptist's dad. Zechariah has not said a word for nine months because prior to this story, we hear that Zechariah, who was a priest in the temple, had been in the temple doing his priestly things when an angel appeared. Now, here's what you need to know about Zechariah. Zechariah is an old dude, and he's married to an old gal, past childbearing years, and they don't have any kids. So, like, that didn't happen for them, which is they're very sad about that, but it's more than sad because this is a time and a place where there's, there's no sort of social safety net. So your children are the ones who look after you in your old age. So it's a, it's a scary thing not to have kids. So they don't have kids and they're not having kids at this point. Zechariah is in the temple, he's doing his priestly stuff, and an angel shows up and says, Hey, Zechariah, guess what? Your wife, Elizabeth, is going to have a kid. And he's like, yeah, actually, that's not going to happen. That's, uh, that's behind us now. Thanks for poking that sore spot. And so the angel says, well, here's the deal, Zechariah. It is going to happen, but because you didn't believe in God's faithfulness, because you didn't trust that God could do even this in the midst of your sorrow and your predicament, your lips are going to be sealed until it happens, and until you are able to proclaim God's faithfulness. And you're going to do that by calling this child John, because John means God is faithful. So until you can name, until you can affirm God's faithfulness and trust it fully, not a peep out of you, and it doesn't say that he was also deaf, but later on we hear that his friends had to communicate with him through gestures and signs. So you don't kind of have to do that if somebody can hear. So Zechariah, he's not hearing or saying anything until his son is born. And then, of course, eight days later, as is the custom, all the neighbors and the family, they come because it's the naming of the child. And this is a really important ceremony. And this is a, a first and only son. So the, the tradition is, that the custom would be to name that son after his papa. Uh, so the, the friends all say to Elizabeth, they're like, so you're going to name him Zechariah? And she says, oh, no, we're naming him John. And they're like, mm, that's not done. There's nobody in your family named John. So we're just going to ask Zechariah because maybe you need to still recover from the birth. So they go over and they're like, and Zechariah asks for something to write on. And he writes, his name is John. And in that moment, his lips and his ears are opened up, and he starts praising God, and that's what we read this morning. And he starts by saying, God has delivered us. God has already redeemed us. 
a pretty remarkable thing for Zechariah to say because he is living under occupation as are all those people in the house with him. They are still very much an oppressed people living the reality of occupation under Roman Empire. And he doesn't say, blessed be God, because God is going to rescue us. He said, blessed be God, because God has rescued us. It's already a fait accompli. It is done. Even though it's still a work in progress. Even though it's not yet, it is already. Now, Zechariah has learned a little something over the last nine months. He didn't believe that in, in the midst of the sorrow and the vulnerability of his, childless, his family's childlessness, that there was any possibility that that could get turned around. He didn't, he didn't trust that God could do that. And he paid a price for that. But he has learned something. He has learned that God's promises in being promised are already being fulfilled. That God's, God's promised justice and peace and wholeness and healing are already, even when they are not yet. And it's when he names his child, God is faithful. When he's able to understand God is faithful faithful, that he realizes he is and his people are already liberated, even though still oppressed. He's understood something about what his son, John, and later John's cousin, Jesus, would talk about, which is that the kingdom of God is already here among you. And you need to be constantly looking forward to it because it's still coming. It's now, and it's coming. And Zechariah gets it, and he sings it, and his friends think he's weird because he's totally unconventional, and he's breaking with norms, and this is the, the, the not-done behavior, this naming of your child after no one, and this singing a song about how we're all redeemed when clearly we are not. And that's what happens with folks who really get and live that Jesus way, that, that godly discipleship, is they are living a reality that is already but not yet. And so they seem a little out of sync. They seem to not kind of get what's going on, like open your eyes. And it's not about denying present reality. It's not about living in some other world, you know, where you're just not touched by present reality. It's about living in this reality right now, but living out of a truth that you know God is faithful and you can trust that even as we're waiting for and working for God's kingdom, it is here among us and participating in it right now. You're always going to seem a little weird if you do that. But you're also going, like Zechariah, to be able to sing in the midst of oppression, to be a person of peace in the midst of war, to be a person who knows yourself intimately and, and ir un undividedly connected to everyone, no matter what you're being told. I had an experience of this kingdom of God already, but not yet. This weekend, actually. I know we're still in the weekend, but for the first two days of this weekend, I was in Toronto at a general council executive meeting. And this is a, a group of about 18 folks who gather to, on behalf of the whole church, uh, seek to offer some leadership and, and uh, visioning for the church and to make some big decisions. One of the big issues that we have been wrestling with as a church, and this is particularly flowing out of the last general council meeting where it became really clear 
to the church that although we think of ourselves as an anti-racist and anti-oppression church and like, you know, we got this, like we're on that, um, we learned very starkly that we are not there yet, that we have a lot of work yet to do and that there is still in how we work and how we are church together uh, an embedded racism and an embedded ableism and embedded homophobia and all kinds of other isms which is not easy to hear but out of that the, the executive is really seeking to help figure out how we can move the church forward and beginning with ourselves so when we whenever we get together we we are very intentional about trying to meet in a way and operate in a way that really roots out racism and roots out all those oppressive tendencies that are right there in the room with us and right there in, in our hearts. And that has not been an easy thing. And it has sometimes um, bubbled up in ways that are, are hard and, and contentious and, and where people have had to name difficult dynamics that are present. Um, but because we've been willing to do that, there's a, a growing trust in the group. And so we actually focus quite a bit of time and attention on these issues at this meeting. And, and as always, it's hard because we're having to look deep in ourselves at stuff we don't want to see and to, to look at the dynamics amongst us and see the stuff that we don't want to see. But as I was sitting there, I experienced several times over the course of the two days these moments where I thought, this is it. This is what that, that kingdom of, of peace and sh that God's shalom, that justice, like we're living it, not perfectly, but we're in it. We're doing it. It is already a reality amongst us that we are, we are practicing anti-oppression even as we're trying to figure out what it looks like to be anti-oppressive. And I felt it. I was just filled with this incredible gratitude and joy. Like, I was thinking about Zechariah, and it's like, oh, that's what happened for him. No wonder he stood up and started. I wanted to do that. I didn't. But I wanted to do it. Like, hallelujah, we are living the kingdom, even as we're trying to figure out the path to the kingdom. I share that good news story with you because I think we need to remember we need to be filled with hope. We need to be those who hear Zechariah's song because it's a call to us. It's a call to us to look at our own reality, the, this moment that we're in in Canada and in, in our own lives and to say, what does it look like to really proclaim with our lives that God is faithful, that God's promises are reliable, and that, that this kingdom of, of peace and justice and unity and wholeness is already here. To, to live it now, even as we're waiting for it to be so. I was thinking about how we've just come through another election cycle. And it just seems to me that, I don't know if anybody else is noticing this, but it seems like each time we go into an election cycle, provincially or federally, that the, the tone of things is becoming more and more divisive, more and more polarized. There seems to be less of a meeting place for folks to say, yeah, my politics aren't the same as yours, but we're totally with you on this. That, like, there's none of that, right? It's like, you're, you're with us or you're against us, you know? And, and those people over there, they can't be trusted. And if, you know, like, you don't represent me and I'm not with you. And we're being encouraged to kind of pull apart, to see ourselves as not part of one another. And I got to wondering... What are we as disciples of Jesus, as those who are called to live that vision of God's kingdom 
right now? What is our call in the midst of this reality? What, what does it mean to actually live wholeness and unity, which is not uniformity, but unity across difference, when the world is telling us that's not possible? You are other from each other. What if we refused that? What if we didn't play by those rules because we understood a truth in God's faithfulness, that promise that we are, we do belong to each other already. We are already one. As Jesus said to his disciples, may you be one that the world might know that you all are one. What if we were already one even in the midst of this division? and acted like it, what would we do differently? What would we model for the world? I think that, that Zechariah is calling us, reminding us to boldly, courageously, and occasionally ridiculously live as if particularly those whose politics are totally different from yours, to live like those folks are your close relations. They are part of you. And you can't be you without them. And they can't be who they are without you. And we need one another. What if we practice that, friends? I think Zechariah would like us to. I think Jesus is inviting us to. And I pray that God will grant us the courage to risk it. Because it's risky. Because people are going to think you're living in non-reality. I want to end by sharing with you a poem by Madeline Long... Do over. Hang on. By Madeline Longell. She wrote this, um, it's an Advent poem, and we are, next week Advent begins, but I heard this poem this weekend, and I thought, oh, that's actually, those are the words I need to get ready for Advent, which is getting ready. So it's called First Coming. He did not wait till the world was ready, till men and nations were at peace. He came when the heavens were unsteady, and prisoners cried for release. He did not wait for the perfect time. He came when the need was deep and great. He dined with sinners in all their grime, turned water into wine. He did not wait till hearts were pure. In joy he came to a tarnished world of sin and doubt, to a world like ours, of anguished shame. He came and his light would not go out. He came to a world which did not mesh, to heal its tangles, shield its scorn. In the mystery of the word made flesh, the maker of the stars was born. We cannot wait till the world is sane, to raise our songs with joyful voice, to share our grief, to touch our pain, he came with love. Rejoice. Rejoice. Friends, as you go from here, Go knowing that God is faithful. Place all your hope and trust in that truth and live that reality each day. And go knowing that you are blessed by God, Creator, Christ, Spirit, who lives in you, moves through you, and works among us to bring that kingdom 
which is already and not yet. Amen. Oh.